Well, it was another uh, crush proof episode of Dynamite this mm. past week or this week or yesterday. Whatever it was, <laughs> whatever's <laughs> happening, it happened it was, and we saw most of it. It was last night as we speak. It was mere hours ago. I don't see how you could put something like this out of your memory. I can't. If we're still talking when the ratings come in. Or when the levy breaks, whichever <laughs> phrase might describe what the f*** that's going to look like. Jesus, Mary and Joseph, what was going on? They usually do a good number when the show's really awful. That's why well, I don't have any faith case, in Well, in that case, we're looking at a record-setting f***ing run here, folks. Do you remember, Brian, we, we, since this back and forth, it, it we started calling it a wrestling war, then it... I think we've settled into, as I referenced the other day, Tony's tilting at some windmills. But at various points over the last three years or whatever, we've said, you know, AEW might just, they might just be ready to make a run at this thing. And then three or four weeks later, they'd shoot themselves in the foot some fucking how. And then every once in a while, we would say, you know, it looks like the WWE is trying to throw this thing. And then something would happen and they'd get a little better. And then every once in a while we'd say, you know, it looks like neither side wants to win this, but then something would happen. But now I think it has come down to the WWE is going to get richer than they've ever been while boring us all to tears. And AEW, they apparently are going to be locked up in a proverbial padded cell as a program for completely melting down on the air. And I guess they're trying to attract viewers now by making people want to... How do the kids say it? Watch it ironically? In other words, hey, look at this stupid shit. You got to see this silly-ass bullshit. Is that how they're going to mount their offensive? I don't know, and things could always happen, and there's been word recently that there are a lot of WWE contracts coming up for 2024 that have not been renewed yet. I don't know who exactly, or... Oh boy, that's exactly what they need. Well, what I was going to say is, it feels to me like AEW has hit a point. Like, remember there was, op you know, I hate to go back to TNA again, but remember when there was optimism around TNA, like, you know what, there's a real shot. I was there for a point of that. And then after it didn't work out, it kind of never, it just trolleyed along, and it still is, but nothing ever happened. The audience never got bigger again. With AEW, it's not become, it's becoming a worse and worse show, where you watch it and you're like, what the fuck is AEW doing? And I've been watching since the beginning. I've seen all sorts of stupid shit. Lately, it's fucking home invasions. It's fucking bad segments in homes. <sighs> There's the person writing the show should be confined to a home. And that's the other problem. Whether you like AEW or not. And a lot of these guys, obviously, as everyone knows, really get to do what they want. But Tony wants to put his stamp on things. The same guys writing the show today that was writing it four years ago, whatever. And it's not getting better. It's getting worse. And right now, they're at a point in time where. They have to renew their deal, apparently, with their partner at Warner Brothers Discovery, and they're going to... We have established through Tony's own slipping lips that Warner owns some part of this thing, whether or not they have any say in creative or voting. How did, how did he phrase it? Any of the voting, he has 100% of that, but they got a piece of this thing. We can say that we've heard from a few sources, and then actually another one got in touch a couple weeks ago after we talked about something on the air. And everyone says the same thing. These are people with connections outside of wrestling, just media reporters who are not wrestling fans. The word on the street is that Warner Brothers Discovery owns a piece of AEW. Now, whether that means they literally own a piece of it with Shad and Tony, or whether that means while they are on Warner Brothers Discovery program, while their programs, I should say, are on Warner Brothers Discovery Television, they get a allotted split of profits. 
That's interesting because remember, we keep hearing from Tony's own lips that Warner Brothers Discovery wants more pay-per-views. They want Wonder monthly why. Pay- they want monthly pay-per-views. They want to get money monthly. So we don't know exactly what the deal is, how it's structured. But I could say, again, we now have, like I think, three different people outside of wrestling. Word on the street is that Warner Brothers Discovery has a piece of it. So we'll see and- what that means. Is this company starting to become one of those that the TV network knows? Well, we're not going to get a lot of people, but we're going to get a smaller number that are very loyal. We're not, if we're getting a piece of the pay per view, we're not going to get a big number on pay per view like goddamn, you know, a multi million dollar Conor McGregor fight, but we're going to get, there's a hundred thousand of these people that will buy anything we put out every month, every week, even whatever the case, are they, are they starting to look at it like that? We don't know how they're looking at it, but here's what we could say. Not to take anything away from any of the misdeeds of Vince McMahon and not to forgive him for any of them. This isn't about that. But when a network dealt with Vince McMahon, if you ever hear any interviews and anyone who's done business with him, they feel like they're dealing with a serious person who knows what he's doing and is more than likely in control of himself. Yes. Tony's a different kind of person. So you're David Zasloff or anyone who's an executive over there, whoever replaces Zasloff eventually, you're dealing with a different animal. And it's his company. It's his baby. It's his project. I mean, I joked about it. It's his trust fund. I mean, this is his money. Yeah. It's a different thing. I mean, do they think Tony is as serious as a serious business person? Have any of the whatever you want to call them, scandals, self-induced scandals, embarrassing episodes time after time after time. Has anyone over there gotten a little tired of that? We don't know. Is there anyone over there who's still just, we really need and want wrestling on the network? We don't know. You know, and again, it goes back to, we don't know the nature of, the exact nature of the AEW Time Warner Discovery relationship and The problem with these media scrums and media interviews that Tony does, he loves doing them. And people in wrestling media typically want to be there and be part of the action. But who's getting a real question answered? He doesn't answer anything about any of this stuff. And it's a private company. So we don't know very much, but it's impossible to tell me you could look at AEW right now where they are and the direction of the programming and think that things look good. Well, speaking of ugly television programming, let's talk about last night. Because I wish somebody at the scrums, <laughs> could they just uh, jot down notes on Wednesday nights to ask Tony about, okay, what was this supposed to mean in seg four of this show when you did this or that? Maybe you could answer those questions. Um, the first half an hour was apparently meant to put MJF in the middle of everything. Everything going on in the company now revolves around MJF. And because there's... Tony's got him stuck again with the Ring of Honor tag team belts with a partner that he never sees because he's off at fucking the other guy's house and he needs surgery and a blah, blah, blah. So they start the show with Renee Moxley Good in the back with MJF And she asks, obviously, about Adam Cole. Well, yeah, and he calls Adam Cole on his phone. This is the start of the show. They're just doing a backstage pre-tape. And Adam answers. And as soon as he does, in come Roderick Strong, neck brace, flea collar, whatever, and the in the wheelchair with Taven and Bennett. And as soon as Adam hears them, he cuts the call off and, okay, And then Roddy offers MJF to, you know, they'll be, the three of them will be his help against the Bullet Bang Club gang. And, you know, even if he was the guy in the devil mask, they don't care. They'll help him anyway. So you got one guy in a neck brace and a wheelchair offer to back you up. That's an attractive proposition. So MJF shoves Roddy's wheelchair back out of frame 
and Taven and Bennett run after him, and suddenly it's like he rolled off a cliff because they're just gone, right? That was my favorite part. Oh, yeah, he couldn't have rolled it. How far could he have fucking gone? <laughs> You'd still hear some, oh, stop me, or whatever, but it just, uh, gone. That's, he should have screamed. I mean, he screams every episode for no reason. Why not? Ah! And yeah, it just uh, instantly, boom. And then MJF, this is the thing. He turned to the camera and immediately goes into, from shoving a guy in a comedy s- spot in a wheelchair to a fired up promo on gin and juice all of a sudden where he's screaming and his neck is, you know, veins are popping. And then the video scrambles and the guy in the devil mask pops up and then it scrambles again and they go into the show open. And I'm like, gee, they went from comedy to horror in 60 seconds. What? It's schizophrenic. And again, wait till we get to the rest of the program. But again, they're they're going from a fucking late 50s hammer film to goddamn to the groove tube. And what the fuck? Help me. I can't. I can't help you. MJ and MJF went from the goofiness of the phone and then the Roddy interaction, every interaction with Roddy's goofy, to cutting a serious promo. What did he say? He's going to put a bullet in Juice Robinson? or what? No, he's got, a, he's got a bullet with his name on it. Because of the bullet club and the play on words. But he's screaming and he's mad. It's like suddenly he went from, oh, I understand why, Adam, you'd want to hang up on me with this weasel here and shoving him in the wheelchair to suddenly, I'll kill you! And he's trying to do everything. And you can tell that Tony realizes he's got nobody left on his fucking roster that creates on their own interesting, compelling television. He fired the other guy. And so he's interacting MJF with every fucking body. And because of that, MJF not only is being spread too thin, but also he's having to go from this emotion to that emotion to this emotion from zero to 60 and back again from being violently angry to putting up with some fucking, we'll get to the caster thing to fucking everything in between. And it's goddamn it's, it's dragging him down instead of him lifting the company. The company is an albatross around MJF's neck and this method of presentation for him is not a long-term deal. As we're seeing, babyface MJF is having to suffer more fools than heel MJF would have, and that's why heel MJF got over. But speaking of suffering, let's continue with the program. So the first match was the Dynamite Diamond Ring match with MJF and Juice Robinson. And I thought I thought it ironic that juice got juice in this match but um it, this should have been a jump start and it should have been hot and he should have been mjf kicking the shit out of the heel which they did do i'm not faulting that but when they went to the floor he throws him into the rail he throws him over the table okay that's good stuff too they were on the floor for fucking ever And one time, in like a three-minute period, MJF rolls in the ring to break the count, flips the referee off, and he's trying. But God damn it. The whole match for the first, until they went to the break, pretty much was on the floor when the guns distracted him and Juice took over. Finally, it got a little heat going, and they got back in the ring. But Juice, again, has way more oomph than Jay White. I don't know why that they somehow decided that Jay White should be the singles guy in this. And I think they're both better as a team with Juice doing the talking. I'm not advocating that Juice should be the world champion either. But we know pretty much Jay White will be the most blasé, fucking boring world champion since Hangnail Page. And anyway, as I spoke about Jay White saying, boy, Juice has more oomph than... He does. Jay White came out and they went to the break. They were keeping this moving 
at the at the first half, even though they were out on the floor, boom, boom, boom. And I thought when they came back from the break, when Juice went to choke again MJF with his own scarf, they'd done that a time or two, but MJF turned it around. That's great. That's a, a, a heel who switched babyface, giving a heel a taste of his own medicine. He needs to do a little bit more of that. Yes. And the people like it, but the referee turned around and caught him and didn't call a disqualification. But if the, if the heels are going to distract so the heel can do, that's when the baby face turns it around, but does it behind the referee's back. You can't just have the referee turn around and catch him. That spoils the whole fucking deal. Anyway, uh, then suddenly after Juice gouged his eyes, MJF just made a comeback at 100 miles an hour. And again, I like both these guys work better than most everybody in AEW, so this was still a better match than anything else we're going to see tonight. But finally, it, it, it picked up there with MJF's comeback. He milked the kangaroo kick and hit it and got the big pop. But then Juice stopped him again. And MJF hit an eye poke, but Juice hit the left and a power bomb. And then they start slowing down. Again, that's a thing. Either they're trying to fill the time or they think they need to do these ups and downs. But on something like this, they had them going. <laughs> they should have kept it going. But Juice foiled the heat seeker, but MJF did a dive on the guns, and Juice stopped him again and got a two count. And that it was slowing down a little there. Finally, the guns drew the referee, and Juice went for the fake ring, and MJF went for the real ring. And MJF's the one that landed the punch and then nailed both of the guns off the apron and hit the heat seeker on Juice. One, two, three. So to that point, as a match and following along with what has been done before, the fake ring, the real ring, the matches for the Dynamite Diamond Ring, the only question I have in the logic is if the match is for the ring, why didn't the referee have the real ring? But nevertheless, as it was, that was fine. Right guy won. Match was pretty good. Juice got juice, but it wasn't a, a ridiculous Moxley blood feast or whatever it was natural so far not too bad what did you what grade would you give this segment before we descend into madness brian i don't know about grade but i thought it was pretty good mjf i actually believed him when he was selling his face i mean it looked that bad when he uh, hit the stairs juice robinson has that quality that guys like piper had and then i'm not comparing him to roddy piper i'm just saying Everything he does in the match, you can't take your eyes off him. He's yelling, he's making movements, he's making noise. Not movements like you would call happy feet, but like the right movements. Right. It, and a unique way of moving in his body language. And you can't take your eyes off him, and uh, I like how vocal he is during the match. You hear his voice screaming, and it works. He's the best one in Bullet Club Gold. Selling like an auctioneer, as the boys used to say. And I agree with you. He should be the main guy, not Jay White. Well, but here we go. Because the end of the match is never the end of this thing. So now MJF has beaten Juice Robinson, and the guns jump in and start kicking the shit out of MJF. And then suddenly... Taven and Bennett wheel Roddy to the ring. He's still in the wheelchair and the neck brace, and, and they wheel him to the ring, and then Taven and Bennett roll in and get in a four-way with the guns. And apparently in this instance, are, are Taven and Bennett baby faces because they're making a save on the biggest baby face to company against two heels? I don't know, but nevertheless, the guns kick shit out of Taven and Bennett and drop them both back to the floor. Whereupon, they just quit trying to come back in. You don't see them again for a while. Or Roddy. The guns dump both them over the top, and Jay White comes in, and now all four of the heels just pick MJF up, and they're leisurely going to have their way with him to perform various acts of mayhem and penetration that are obviously not going to be pleasant 
And then suddenly the acclaimed music plays. And here comes Caster and Bowens and Billy Gunn. And those three baby faces hit the ring and the four heels in the ring with the high ground, with the fucking title belt and the diamond ring or the fake ring all bail out on before the acclaimed and Billy can even touch him. Because I guess that that's too close to being even odds. So then the heels leave and run to the entranceway while the acclaimed check on MJF and then Jay White gets the microphone. And Jay White and the microphone should never be used in the same sentence. We've come to find this out. Because I swear to God, he'd been doing commentary through the match. Color at the desk, but I could block that out. Because I never listened to the announcing here anyway. And mostly he was just screaming, come on, Juice, and all that stuff. But now he's cutting a promo that he's blown up like he's had a match. And it sounds like an indie guy playing fucking wrestler. It's whiny, and it's not convincing, and it's not verbiage and delivery and inflection that grabs you or captivates you. It's some fucking indie guy with a goddamn man bun cutting a promo. Am I overstating this? I mean, you make me hate him more than I do every time you start going through this because I can't really debunk anything you're saying. Again, he's good in the right setting. It's just that setting is never in the ring in front of people with a live mic. Or 20 minutes into a goddamn segment of him and his gangbang gang. I don't think that's their name. I think they're the Bang Bang the Gang. Well, bang bang, my baby shot me down. So he's got MJF's belt and he ain't getting it back. When they go to WWE, will they become the banging enthusiasts? <laughs> no, because... They're not allowed to trademark that because WWE already has bangers trademarked for the brutes. Oh, that's right. So they'll have to that's be the right. clangers. Bangers versus the, clangers at Mania? You got, to, you got to hangers, the clangers, the bangers. It's going to be a whole, it's going to be faction warfare. <laughs> so let me, now this is going to be hard enough to keep up with anyway. Now, here, so let me try to do this. So White cuts the promo that he's got MJF's title belt and MJF ain't getting it back from him. And then Colton Gunn cuts a promo, tells MJF that they, the Guns, want a Ring of Honor tag team title match at full gear, which would necessitate them wrestling MJF at full gear, correct? Because he's yeah. the champion. Yeah. Since Adam Cole is out, and he's going to defend him until Adam gets back. So they've challenged him to a tag team title match. Well, MJF tells the ass boys then to shut up, but agrees to the match. It's, it'll be a handicap match for the tag team title at full gear. But then he also tells them that next week he's going to take Jay White up on the offer that he made a week or two ago for an eight-man tag match versus the four of them versus MJF and three partners, and he will get his belt back he being MJF from Jay White, if his team, he being MJF, wins that match. But then, at that point, Roddy, who is apparently still at ringside with these other two five fucking minutes ago, they got knocked out of the ring. He screams, Max! Pick us, you'll pick us. He wants, he being Roddy, wants MJF to pick the three of them, including the guy in the wheelchair, as his three partners, and MJF turns that down. And then Caster says, well, that means us! Because they're still in the ring. And MJF tells Caster that he never liked him, even when they were training together. And in a million years, if he was on fire, and Caster, and, and MJF was so flustered by this point, he couldn't form a cogent simile. 
And he said, if I was on fire and the only thing that you, the other thing, the only thing that would take it away was you or something. You can't even say it. I don't even I know what he said. I can't even say it because yeah. it didn't make any fucking sense. My boy, what have they done to my boy? So he said, fuck you anyway to Caster. I hate you. I despise you. And then Caster says, so you're saying there's a chance. Ugh. And then Bowen starts yelling at Caster, no, grandma. again, they went from melodrama, they went from a war movie to a goddamn The Keystone Cops by Max Sennett in the same segment. And then... This feels more like late period WCW than any other time in AEW history. Oh, boy, howdy. Well, now the fucking heels on the ramp are gone. The Bang Clang gang... Cause they can't hang. Well, no, and they're they're not they're not the clangers. You said the other people. Well, no, you said they would be the clangers. No, I take it yeah, back. they'll be. Yeah, well, whoever they have. So Jay, Jen, and Juice and the guns are gone by now because now Caster is interacting with MJF and what it says. Well, basically, uh, it'll be okay if you just do one thing, and he holds out his fingers to scissor with MJF. And MJF milks like it's the goddamn handshake between fucking Hogan and Savage or whatever. And then he reaches over and squeezes closed Caster's fingers and walks off. And so now, again, this started out with MJF beating the second-in-command of the bangers and clangers in order to get heat with Jay White for, a obviously, the title match that I thought they were going to fucking have upcoming on full gear. But then it became a goddamn clusterfuck where now MJF is going to wrestle the guns at full gear for the ring of honor tag team title, but they got an eight man tag next week, but nobody knows who MJF's three partners are, but now they're reduced to doing comedy about fingering each other. And then as MJF, to try to not get any on him, walks off and leaves the acclaimed and Billy in the ring to do whatever the fuck it is that they're doing. Then they play Twinkle Toes McFinger Bangs music. And he comes out to the entranceway. And they have a face-off, they being Twinkle Toes and MJF. And now it's a chance for, and remember last week, as you will recall, MJF whispered some about 13 days, bitch, because MJF is about to break Kenny's record for longevity as AEW champion. Now they're calling it a streak. You know who, in my opinion, broke Kenny's streak of being the AEW world champion? The guy that won it from him. But now, since the WWE has made it important about how many days that a champion has been a champion, now they're stealing WWE concepts and applying them here in this multifaceted, multi-man, multi-malted milkshake of a goddamn angle that they're doing, where Tony is, I'm telling you, was it? Was it a fucking a line of bees that he snorted to get here? Or what? So anyway, Kenny, Kenny, he gets the microphone and he looks out at the crowd and then he breathlessly gasps. And I swear to God, he breathlessly gasped this because I wrote it down word for word. Are you ready, Brian? I'm ready, this Brian. Is, this is supposedly the greatest living wrestling artist and one of their top box office attractions. You have something I want, and I have something you want. Walking out with a live mic, I lost that right the second that, uh, I lost what's not around your waist. So even though I have no right to ask, and, uh, if you're the type of scumbag that I think you are, You'll laugh in my face. Tell me to suck on some lemons. Tell me to fly a kite. Dealer's choice. 
Editor's note, he really says these things in real life, you can tell. I expect him to cuss somebody out by saying, Pickle, you kumquat! Put the French toast! Shut the front door! He continues, But if you're their scumbag, if you're the champion I think they want you to be, heck! He said, heck! Heck! If you're the champion I think deep down inside you want to be, then hear me out. I want that belt, Max. I reserve the right to defend my streak. Defend his streak? It's going to be over in six days, you weasel. You should have thought about this before now, but it's not a streak because you got beat. Yeah, well, since when is a title ring called a streak? A streak. I reserve the right to defend my streak. So if you're better than me and you know it, then Max... Gee, golly, gosh, don't be afraid to show it, pal. He's son of a gu- I swear to God, he actually said, gee, golly, gosh, don't be afraid to show it, pal. He had a streak in his pants when they still <laughs> bit his arm. <laughs> what? You have got a fucking... In- uh- Even in 1973, much less in 2023, you have this fucking feckless, pussy-ish, breathless, bug-eyed baby face out there going, heck, and gee golly gosh. What the, tell me to suck on some lemons. Tell me to go fly a kite. How about... I'm going to break my foot off in your ass, you son of a bitch. That might be what Steve Austin would have said. I talk like a robot from the 80s. I don't know. I'll tell you why. I had a couple of motorized devices from the 80s that emitted different sounds than that. What is MJF thinking standing there having to stare him in the face because that's what the segment calls for? Yes. And he's just talking gibberish. He's not saying anything. Just gibberish. In a... Again... Kenny, the phone sex industry is still, it's, 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 it's honest work. It's legal. There's no reason that you have to do this wrestling thing as a cover. But anyway, so then MJF has to answer. It's like phone sex on Perkadan. Phone sex on somebody else's fucking credit card. <laughs> so then MJF has to answer. And he... <laughs> Then, I mean, this was the the one thing you can say about Kenny Olivier there is that this was the most inoffensive way to ask for a, a match that I've ever heard in my life. It was like hat in hand. I think he said I came a hat in hand. That was one of the other things he said. But it was like, please, sir, may I have some more? It was the Oliver Twist of asking for a fucking match. It He didn't insult him in any way he was so polite it was like uh, uh, i mean uh, of course that's why he doesn't draw any money because he's a gutless fucking idiot with microscopic balls that nobody could potentially look up to as a fucking ass kicker or a fucking hero i'm the best belt machine well there you go but now mjf has got to answer the grinning mincing breathless pirouetting And he's screaming at him. This Saturday, collision, AEW title match. Hey, I'm going to give it to you. What? It made the best man win, and they shake hands. But then MJF does, I'm better than you, and you know it to Twinkle Toes. And then Twinkle Toes says, well, then, adieu, goodbye. He actually said, He, he made a blowy kiss sound. And good night, bang. And oh, Max. Oh, Max. Three days, bitch. You know what? I ju- it just hit me. I mean, you verbatim went through what Kenny said, including the big finale there. Can you hear, if you took this dialogue, wouldn't it fit in with Miss Piggy? The way yes. she would talk. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and you, goodbye. Mwah. Three days, bitch. Good night, bang. <laughs> so we're 30 minutes into the show, and that all that we have seen is the start to finish of this epic saga where they've set up more matches than you can keep track of. It's the worst MJF segment of television, I think, in the history of ever. I mean, some of the 
MJF Adam Cole buddy comedy slow mo that was preposterous, but it was over in two minutes. This was just never ending. And and the, uh, 2024 can't come soon enough for Maxwell Jacob Friedman's career because he needs out of here. He is being, as I said, weighed down, drugged to the depth. This is a concrete overcoat on his young career. Take a pay cut, Max, for the sake of your future if you have to to get the fuck out of there. No matter what they offer you, fucking run screaming like your head is on fire. Much like the simile that you were so frazzled by the shit going on around you that you could not form. <sighs> what do you think of the devil mask guy? You think it's Adam Cole? Do you think it's Jack Perry? Who do you think it'll be? Well, it obviously can't be MJF because of the fucking... <laughs> that would just be flattered and a plate oh, full of piss, right? If it turned out it was him just having videos of himself, that would upset yeah, people. That That'd would be bad. Yeah, so it's got to be somebody else. And then the thing, it's, if it's Adam Cole, is it going to be Adam Cole for the next six to nine months till he's healthy again and not be revealed? Is it... I mean, you said Jack Perry. What happened to that little fucking weasel? What happened to that squealing, little whining, bitching, crying, complaining, feckless, dickless fucking pussy? He got drowned in a river of tears. No, I don't know exactly what happened. Uh, we heard that he was suspended, and then we recently heard that he was either ready to come back or they were ready to let him come back. Well, there there's, could be quite a bit of difference between I'm ready to come back and we're ready to let you back. Well, nevertheless, I don't know who it's going to be, but it better not be MJF. We know that much. So, and again, is it going to make any sense? Or it can't be, it can't be Jay White, right? It can't be no, Jay White. No, they jumped Jay White. Jay White. It ju they because jumped, he Jay, jumped White. Jay White. That's right. That means it's going to be Jay White. I tricked you. Look what I did. Yeah, like that. I, I see. I tricked you. I did. Me and Phoebe Figalilly, I put her in the box while you were looking at her. I picked your pocket. <sighs> well, you know, yeah. per, well, go ahead. I don't know. I don't know what I was going to say. Well, what I was going to say is maybe MJF just needs a good night's sleep. <laughs> well, you know, that's something that we all contemplate from time to time is whether or not we're going to get a good night's sleep. And sometimes the the nightmares that we have trying to make sense of these programs that we watch on television preclude us from having a good night's sleep. And that's why you got to, you got to go to a little extra trouble. You got to make a little extra effort, but you got to save some money at the same time on having a good night's sleep. And actually, when I think about it now, if you visit our fine friends at Helix, it's not even a little extra trouble. It's saving money. It's not even a little extra aggravation. You're not even going to have to leave the house. All you got to do is go to their fine website, which we've told you about it before. We'll tell you about it again. again. Helix. That's right. Again. Again. Helixsleep.com. H-E-L-I-X sleep.com. When you go to that website, you're going to see a plethora, a veritable wonderland. Sleep. Sleep in wonderland. Da -da 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 -da. Of different types of mattresses, fun for the whole family, and hey, bring the pets along too. You could you could easily put Rover on one of the kids' mattresses. He'd probably appreciate it more than these no good snot nosed crumb snatchers. But anyway, why are you gonna buy a mattress for a kid that'll just lay there and get peanut butter and jelly all over it? But nevertheless, I digress. Is that what you, you would do in your bed? You would get peanut butter and jelly all over your bed? Various eating, you know, not, uh, eating substances, drippage, gravy. Mama Cornette grease. allowed you to eat in your room? Well, it, it was shoved under the door and I could do with it there what I wanted as long as the chain would reach. Under the door? But anyway, you go to the helixsleep.com website and you see all this wide variety or array or a, a variety. 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 <laughs> Of mattresses in front of your very eyes. They got mattresses for big and tall sleepers. Mattresses for people that want to heat up and cool down. I heat up. I cool down. I got the music in me. I got the mattress in me. That You're going to have the mattress under you. Because they offer 
I'll have you know, 100-night free trials. You can sleep on one of these son-of-a-guns for over three months. Last I checked, that's 100 nights, right? And if you don't like it, and you're slow to make up your mind, you can just send it back. They'll give you your money back. I think they're being suckers about the whole thing. You realize if four mattress companies had a deal like that, why, you could sleep the whole year for free. Well, they're confident in the quality of their work, and I must say we have some of their mattresses here in the house. We have two different Helix mattresses here in the house, and of course, their wonderful all-form couch, and yes, very comfortable. They had nothing yes. to worry about. We weren't sending it back they'd have to pry those things from your cold, dead fingers, wouldn't they? Well, I don't know about so fingers. It'd be hard fact, to grip folks, the... Well, go ahead. I was just going to say, folks, be prepared to defend these things. You're not going to want to give them up. So when the mattress police come, they're going to have to pry them out of your cold, dead fingers because you're going to sleep so good on these Helix mattresses that when these people come up your front yard, up your driveway, beating on your front door, screaming, send out your mattresses! You're going to say, fuck you, you'll have to pry it from my cold, dead fingers because I sleep great on whatever variety of Helix mattress that you have purchased. I mean, they've got ones even designed for specific sleep positions, like reverse cowgirl. And That's how you sleep? Well, you never say, to each their own, whatever flips your trigger or floats your flips boat. Flips your trigger? Flips your trigger, <laughs> trips your trigger, whatever flips your flopper. <laughs> <laughs> and if your spine <laughs> Shut up now. Clangers and bangers. Folks, if your spine after you do flipping and flopping needs some extra TLC, they've even got a hybrid design combining individually wrapped steel coils in the base with premium foam layers on top. Whoa. That sounds like a marital aid that I once bought online. But it's the perfect combination of comfort and support, apparently, and potentially penetration. Folks, all you got to do is take the Helix Sleep Quiz, just tell them what your preferences are, and they'll match you up with a model that you will love and want to be on top of. I mean a mattress, not an actual model that you'll want to be on. I, they might also do the escort thing in their spare time. They don't. I don't if know why you're going you here. Nope. Some type of fashion they will not you match can... you up with anything other than a fine mattress that you will be matched up with if they're going through their fine online survey to find exactly the right mattress for you and any of this other superfluous stuff maybe happening over in the perverted world of Castle Cornet. Let's say well, Cornet Manor. It's my manor. It's his castle. Yeah, whatever And we need manners manor when we're talking about a fine mattress like Helix Sleep's amazing mattresses, and there were so many of them. Well, whatever you want to do with your super fluids with a model on any of these mattresses is completely your own business. But nevertheless, right now, we can save you money. Not on the model, but on the mattress. You can get 20% off all mattress orders and two free pillows right now. If you go to the aforementioned helixsleep.com slash JCE, see the slash JCE, that's the, uh, that's the important part. That's the secret knock where they know that you're with us and they'll give you the 20% off and the two free pillows. And they, these pillows ain't just a couple of bags of hot steel balls either. They're, they're as comfy as sleeping in a, well, in a bird's nest, like you see those little baby birds chirping away. They just, yeah, they're all fuzzled up and curled up in, in these pillows. You can, it's like you're floating on a cloud. What are those sensory deprivation pillows? You think the birds in a nest look comfortable? Uh, well, they're, they're, they're certainly there uh, anxiously awaiting their mother to feed them, but they seem to be nestled in all right. Seems like they can't wait to dive out of it as soon as they can. Well... You won't feel that way about your Helix Sleep mattress, so apparently that's a new tagline then. Helix Sleep mattress is more comfortable than sleeping in a bird's nest. See, I've just done their job for them. That's right. What's the promo code, Jim? HelixSleep.com slash JCE. Well, Jim, let's hop out of bed and get back to this exciting episode of Dynamite. Well, okay, big boy. Hi. Oh, you want me to continue? Put a ring on it. Hey, well, does that mean we can scissor? All right. So, Wardlow did a little interview package from some location somewhere. Was it in? Let me stop you right there because this is part of 
I couldn't stop thinking about this. Was it Philadelphia? Because they were in Philadelphia. Did they shoot him going up the stairs like Rocky? Well, it. I didn't. I didn't back it up to say for sure, and I didn't see it again, so I don't know. But apparently, that he was just out and about in Philadelphia. But the point is, I wanted to hear. Okay, what's his story? What's he? What's he doing? You know, he knocked down Tony Schiavone the other week. He's been power bombing everybody. Why is he pissed off at the world? Well, he's pissed off at the world because he had to sit at home for four months, not from injuries, not being on vacation, but going into a dark place. Because he had to see that no good MJF become everybody's favorite, become the world heavyweight champion. Everybody loves MJF and everything. He's the most popular guy. Okay, why did why did that make Wardlow have to sit at home for four months? Again, like, like when Hobbs got pissed off at Jericho when he was seven. They'd been in the same company for four years, but he took four years to punch him in the face or whatever. Well, now... It's almost like they're pretending everything that happened after the pay-per-view where Wardlow beat MJF didn't happen. Yeah, the last time that he was over, about a year and a half ago, when he beat MJF and then MJF went on to be the world champion and they couldn't come up with anything for Wardlow besides powerbombing people, you know, every six months or so. But why did he have to sit at, he, going into a dark place? I was so... You don't want to hear that from some badass fucking heel wrestler, I guess now he's a heel. You don't want to hear, well, they just wouldn't let me come to work. Because Tony didn't have any ideas for me, so I just sit and watch this other guy get more popular than me. No, it, I can understand. I if they'd have done this a year and a half ago, if when MJF was gone, Wardlow was still there, and then MJF comes back, and then Wardlow says, "Wait a minute, I beat this guy, and now he's back, and he's the world champion. I ought to get a shot." His time, his statue, as they say, of limitations for something like, hadn't it run out by now? He's been back and he's been gone again and back again and gone again. Why now? Why now is why I'm asking as my gardener pulls up to my property. Oh, good God. No, and starts there working. No there but are no people there. Stay away from the mushrooms. Are, there are a crew. <laughs> you're hearing there, all of this. This has nothing there, to do with the mushrooms. Your gardeners are bringing you mushrooms. That's why you hear all these fucking noises. They're good people. Listen, they're good people. They just make a lot of noise. But back to they're what we're talking mushroom about. mushroom dealers. No one said that. Again, no evidence or proof of this. Just uh, the gardener. Okay, now I know what gardener has meant all along. On a side note, I used to buy weed years and years and years and years ago on Long Island. Long before the statute of limitations. From a grocer who would get his fresh groceries like in the Bronx. Called it produce? Produce. <laughs> but with the produce, he got just the finest, freshest. It was great stuff. But it was a pain well, in the you ass. Know, it, it's the mom that. and pop shops that have been the backbone of the United States economy for I don't know how long now. That's right. You used to be able to go to any bodega in Brooklyn, and if it had a yellow on it, you can go in there and get whatever you wanted. But whatever. Back to this, what we're talking about is Wardlow, and he had a very visible, almost fluorescent cross around his neck, so or on his shirt. I'm not exactly sure what it was, but it was a weird dichotomy between the religious connotation and whatever he was saying about wanting to kill MJF. No Arn Anderson, obviously. So they've gotten Wardlow away from Arn. We've seen him buy. I, I, I forgot he was with Arn. Exactly. That's the problem. Oh. The way they followed everything they did to follow up Wardlow beating MJF completely blew it. So I agree with going to the, uh, once again, the Bobby Ewing technique. <laughs> None of that happened. <laughs> we'll just start again. Can you get anything out of Wardlow? At this point, I don't know. When I hear these interview pieces i don't know whether they're giving him this because he can't talk on his own or whether this is something that he's written and but he's it sounds like something that he or somebody wrote and he's reciting it it's very 
flowery verbiage. Most people don't talk like that, especially some big badass. But uh, again, it's it never followed up on. Remember, he was, you know, he was suing the. They're getting sued by the fucking security company for beating them up, and it, he's had all these different weird things go on. But whenever you give him the opportunity to speak in the ring as rarely as that has come or to speak on one of these packages. Nothing is jumping out about his verbiage or his delivery or his voice or his. Remember I said, and somebody on Twitter said, and now I can't unsee it. He looks and sounds about as boring as Ethan page, just bigger on the sauce. He just kind of sounds like a boring guy that uses a lot of, Boring words. But when he didn't open his mouth, he looked like the biggest badass of all time. Yeah, so maybe if they'd have had a real manager, Pinocchio, to swerve his mind around to the evil side and take over after he'd beat MJF and do his talking for him and then figure out a way to get him involved in the mix, maybe that would have worked. I, I don't yeah. think this guy can talk for himself because he... He doesn't sound like he means it, and he's already... Remember, we see he's, what, 30-something years old. See, I don't know. Your cross-promotional stables coming together, Wardlow, Nakamura, and you. Oh, good. They Lord. all need talkers. Or a talker. Hey, well, let me just work on breeding some more talkers. I'll work on the breeding. Speaking of breeding, the fruit of Taz's loins was next. Hook who is now apparently a regular tag team with Rob Van Dam because they've done it twice for Tony. That's regular. And they were against uh, the dork order. Long John Silver and Reynolds rap his partner. Just had this popped up out of the blue. I, I did you watch it? I'm not going to watch the dork order. Why? No, I mean, the only thing I noticed is Rob Van Dam has dyed his hair jet black, it looked like. And, you know, it's always sad when you see something. Not, you know, not sad, but... I mean, everyone knows his hair is in black. It's like Vince dyeing his hair black. So it stands out. And you well, can, hear, least Rob, and you can hear, Van... you could hear them in the background now, and you can't say you don't. Well, who? Rob Van Dam and Hook in the background? No, the uh, gardeners with the oh, mushrooms. Oh, we're back to them again. Uh, at least Rob Van Dam isn't tying people to the railroad tracks these days, even if he dyes his hair like Vince. But uh, they did another Tony Storm picture in picture picture. And I'm thinking Tony Storm is a talent that could get over on a sketch show. Like a, a In Living Color, Saturday Night Live, Chappelle <laughs> show. In Living Color went off the air in like 94. Well, God, she's spoofing a silent movie, for fuck's sake. So pardon me for being more contemporary with my references. I'm saying a sketch program of those various genres, right? But not... Your show of got, shows, Texaco Star Theater. Texaco Star Theater. Hey, her and Milton. <laughs> Uncle Milty in a dress. I'm telling you, Sid Caesar and her, Imogene Coco would have been run off the stage. But they're doing this already. The regular program is a parody of a wrestling show. So they're doing parodies of a parody in picture in picture. If, if the, uh, again, if this was the only wacky thing, it would get over like crazy. And she's good, but it's just more silliness on a silly fucking show. Silly, silly, silly. You know what could make it work? And I apologies for the noise behind me. Oh, God damn You know damn what it. can make it work? Don't take the Lord's name in vain over this. What if you get some older woman who could still wrestle, but isn't like well-known enough like a Trish Stratus where she can't take on a new gimmick? And you get her to play Tony Storm's mom, and she sues AEW for the fact that they're taking advantage of her clearly sick daughter who's having a mental breakdown and they're using it for their gain by putting it on their show and playing along with it. And Stella Mae French is the mother. Stella Mae French. Can you imagine? I told you she worked at the dry cleaners I went to in Dallas. Yeah, you told me she like, introduced herself to you as... Yes. Stella Mae French. Stella Mae French. Um, but no, yeah, I, again, that, at least that would be something... 
I don't. They're if just, she's so mentally deranged, why are they putting this on their show? Aren't they aiding yes. and abetting her illness? Well, besides that, at least put it on the fucking show so we don't have to watch the dork order. It's in picture in picture. And Luther is now her Eric von Stroheim. Yeah, because he needed some kind of justification for still being there. Yeah, we're paying him? Well, fuck, stick him in a butler outfit and put him in a corner. And it appears they are rounding up the leaves. This may <laughs> in fact be the spring cleaning. And now cleaning. they're rounding the far turn. There's banana moving up out of the bunch, cigarette pulling up out of the pack, and here comes Beetle Bomb. They are gathering the leaves. I believe this is indeed the spring cleaning that I thought it was. Of the leaves. Pretty soon they'll be starting the funeral pyre. And then the chanting will begin. Starcade 23, the gathering of the leaves. It's a very solemn occasion up there in New England when the gathering of the leaves takes place. Should we move on or do you need to uh, genuflect out your window? At the uh, the passage of the, the caisson with the memorial leaves. I'm leaving the mic open. I want evidence. I want evidence. I want everyone to hear what's happening <laughs> so that it can't be denied. It cannot be. This is a lesson to the world about what happens when you have gardeners come in on podcasting day. So then we got to Tony Schiavone with Sting and Darby Allen. Which sounds like kind of like an old folk song with Sting and Darby, Ellen. And of course, Sting thanked Philadelphia because he didn't thank him last week because he wasn't in Philadelphia. And he thanked Darby Allen, called him the best tag team partner I ever had. And now, is there heat with fucking Luger? Because then later on, Sting said, I know I got a lot of ooze when I said that. You thought I was going to say somebody else. Well, it, what was it? it when he talked about, um, or later on when he accosted Edge, you know, he said, I, I drank the Kool-Aid once. Is there heat with him and Luger? I don't know. I haven't heard anything about that. I mean, they were saying all sorts of stuff. Shivani also said that Sting was the wrestler that put TBS wrestling on the map. <laughs> they said that multiple times. And then they introduced Ric Flair. But multiple times yeah, they said yeah. and then, that Sting but here was, was the this wrestler. other guy. And then, all, and by the way, goddamn... Dusty would like to have a word 10 years previously, but Listen, nevertheless. We're talking TBS wrestling too. <laughs> would like a word. Yeah, Bobby exactly. Rich. Yeah, I mean, it's ridiculous. Tony Atlas would like a foot or a word. <laughs> but anyway, so Sting and Sting also thanks Tony Khan. And then Tony Schiavone takes the microphone and says, Well, Tony Khan should thank you. And he is. So he. And Tony Schiavone went off on this wordy. I don't know if he got lost coming around the far turn, but he had to, you know, come back around to it and finally introduced a present for Sting and they play Flair's music and out comes Ric Flair. And I got the, the people were surprised because he was obviously unadvertised. It wasn't a, oh my God, it's The Rock, or oh my God, it's John Cena unadvertised like we've gotten over the last, you know, couple of months. It was, well, yeah, he's here, wow, but it wasn't like, holy shit, how did they pull this off? He was a gift. Why is he a gift? <laughs> Tony <laughs> Khan has a special gift for Sting. The gift is that Ric Flair was allowed in the building? Well, no, because Tony Khan just watched the toy, and now he understands how to deal with with things like that. But but anyway, does that make Tony Schiavone the uh, Ned Beatty character in that film? Yes, yes, it does. But Flair gets in the ring, and the fans start chanting. Then finally, holy shit, holy shit! But Schiavone says, the announcer of the program says, "Damn right, you can say it." So he's encouraging. The fans to say holy shit on television when they've been trying to bleep the fucks and the the fucks and the sucks and the ducks and all the other things. Anyway, Flair put Sting over big time. You know, the greatest he's ever been in a ring with, etc. But then was this an ad lib where he said, I want 
Hey, what's that March? You're going to retire. I want to ride the the wagon all the way with you. I'll be here right with you till March. What did he just book himself? On live television where Tony's in the back at the monitor going, my God, he's 100 grand a night. Although it is funny, the idea of Ric Flair managing Sting and Darby Allen yeah. <laughs> in Route to Revolution. Well, so whether or not that was a, a, a little seed that needed to be planted or whether it was Rick booking himself for another six months, then he and Sting wooed at each other and rick gave him a playful chop and then here came the christian cage music interrupting and thank god because we needed a little pick me up at this point and here comes christian with dino and his new son nick plain good old nick plain what the fuck just a droop-faced fucking expression and i'm sitting there and i'm saying my god we, we we have pretty much we've eliminated the generation in between that that should be on top here and what we've we've got one guy in his 70s one guy in his 60s and Christians in his 50s still trying to keep the whole thing together and then the the other bunch is not even ready for fucking prime time it Darby standing next to Sting and Flair looks like goddamn contest winner staggered in and at least dino looks like something till you see him wrestle and christian looks like a star and there's nick looking like they're doing a goddamn make a wish fucking appearance with him it is he there work, he, works in, in the he works in that role he works in that role i think for the way they're using him right now. In what role? The here it, it would if this was a movie, would he be credited as slack jawed dullard? He is a 18-year-old who just turned heel and he's going along with this other heel, and he's skinny and he's inexperienced, and they're taking advantage of him. And he works in that role. If he showed up and he was 220 and jacked, it wouldn't work as an 18-year-old as well. Uh, come back to me when you're 25, kid. Anyway. So Christian ripped Flair. <laughs> Tony Khan, he said Tony Khan gave Sting a suit, gold chains, and a black liver. And he promoted Sting and Darby. And of course, Christian wants a six man tag with him and Dino and Nick against Sting and Darby and a partner. And it and he and of course they said, Well, Flair's standing right there. If you want him, get it. We'll take anybody. And he didn't lock him into it, but he teased it enough to where hopefully that's what people they hopefully they think that's what people will think. Uh if for a six man, if you want to get a partner at full gear. And Sting then sneezed because he's allergic to jackasses. That was kind of lame. Well, it is. Riggy Morton was funnier when he did it 30 years ago. And he accepted, they'll find a partner, and we'll see ya. And that was pretty much that. And of course, as we're going to find out later, the partner's going to be Edge, who will not fight his friend Christian for two more weeks or three more weeks, maybe. Uh, but will Flair be in the corner now that he's booked himself? I think, again, going with the idea, too, that Tony Khan is trying to build up these numbers going into the end of the year. Maybe Flair will be around. We'll see what kind of reaction this gets from the AEW fans. Now, we did hear or did see a lot of chatter online from people. Here's Tony Khan, who's been ripping Vince McMahon for, and rightly so, in a sense, for his misdeeds, his crimes, whatever they are. Shooting his shots. His payoffs to women, whatever's going on. Okay, and then you turn around, you hire Ric Flair two weeks later? That's what people are jumping on. There's a double standard there. Well, no, he didn't hire him. He just rented him. He's an independent contractor. Tony is not responsible for the outside-the-ring activities of Ric Flair from 30 years ago just because he chooses to bring him out and give him as a present to another one of his action figures. It was 20 years ago. And it would also... <laughs> remember... Wasn't it Flair that went into business for himself on TNA television and changed his mind on voting for one of the gut check guys? I don't know. Is that true? I don't know. Yes, <laughs> it was. Now that I'm saying it out loud, yes, it was. 
It, the, the, that's why I'm saying Flair will fucking just blurt things out. I think he said, yeah, I'll be with you the whole way till March. So Tony would book him on every pay-per-view at every show now because Flair was the deciding vote on one of the gut check guys. And it was a work, obviously. And they told him to vote no. And the guy fucking fired up and did something. He, and Flair said, fuck it, I'll vote for you. And they had to give him a contract. So who knows? Did you ever think working with Ric Flair, and of course you were very close to Ric Flair, you were put on the booking committee by Ric Flair, did you ever think that when he was in his mid to late 70s, this would be his fashion sense? No, I didn't. No, I didn't get this. Uh, I assumed he was going to be a Michaels of Kansas City customer until, until his final days. I didn't know that he'd go to Snoop Dogs of Brooklyn instead or whatever. He's Is Michaels of Kansas City on acid? I don't, well, I'll tell you, it, my Aunt Lola had a couch cover in the 60s that looked like his suit he was wearing this particular evening. But anyway, so now they've set up a six-man tag for full gear uh, between the Christian contingent, and they're not in a religious way, but it is professional name, and Sting and Darby and, and well, we'll find that out in a second. Um, did you watch any of the Jericho sit down with Rene Moxley good about being roughed up and manhandled by uh, our friend Willie Hobbs? Yeah, I watched it to see what he was going to say. Well, what'd he say? Because I didn't. He uh, has never been treated like this. Renee's really getting into her, uh, her acting on the show. If you watched her in the earlier segment, her body was turned towards the camera while she was holding the mic for no good reason other than she wanted to be seen on camera. <laughs> but... Jericho ended this by saying that he has friends too, and he's going to bring in someone bigger than Powerhouse Hobbs to help him. So that's what big shows do in these days. Jericho, see? Nothing against the big show, who they should have used in some fashion in the last three years or however long he's already been there. No, he just did a local news program on WDRB here because uh, he used to live in town. They know him about uh, the two-for-one tickets they're trying to sell for the Yum Center Dynamite next week. Well, we'll see. It, if it still doesn't have 3,000 tickets sold, to my understanding. We'll see what happens there, but in terms of how to use them, are these the guys you'd put them in there with? Powerhouse Hobbs and Takeshita? No, I was making a fucking joke. I know, I'm asking you, if you're going to use the big show right now at his no, age No, not right, I would not, I would not have Powerhouse Hobbs be in there being dwarfed by a guy that who's either had his last match or going to have his last one or two in the near future. But uh, again, you know, who is Jericho's bigger friend going to be? You don't want to find people bigger than Powerhouse Hobbs. That makes him look smaller. Takeshita's thing is not his size, but, you know, but rather his athleticism and evil intent. Should it be a swerve? Should he bring in the smallest wrestler he knows? And then, and then beat Powerhouse out like he's Bobby Heenan and Dick the Bruiser brought in Little Bruiser. Chris that, Jericho that, and Riho versus Powerhouse Hobbs and Takeshita. What about Chris Jericho and Little Jericho? If they could find a midget that looked just like Chris Jericho. There could be the walls of Jericho. There could be the curb of Jericho. <laughs> there, I'll, I'll end on that one. So the next match was Matt and Jeff Hardy teaming up on free television in a fucking cold six-man tag with their partner, Isaiah Cassidy, because Isaiah Cassidy had a tag team partner named Mark Quinn until apparently Mark Quinn is hurt so bad we're never going to see him again. I don't know what the fuck, where he's at. And they had a babyface match against the Buckaroos and Hangnail Page so they could play with their six-man tag team belts they made up for themselves. And uh, uh, one of the iconic named tag teams in modern wrestling history and they're reduced to having cold matches with other baby faces you know, for a meaningless uh, championship and doing the same shit that the buckaroos and hangnail always fucking do but now it's iconic names that 
potentially could have drawn some money upon their reunion had it been handled right that are now just drifting down the river of mediocrity and despair. An irrelevancy. Did you hear the crowd reaction? Speaking of irrelevancy, did you hear the crowd reactions? The, specifically the Bucks and Page, but even the Hardys. Bleh. Yeah. Well, why, you know, even if they don't really like the Bucks and Page, they probably don't want to boo them because they're technically supposed to be heroes around there. But at the same time, even though they probably used to like the Hardys, what is there to like right now with this presentation especially? So they don't, they don't really want to boo anybody or cheer anybody. They just want it to be over with. Which I skipped ahead until it was over with. Did I miss anything? No, it wasn't uh, that good. It was a typical, typical of the Bucks trying to do their things and Matt Hardy going slower than everyone else in there. And when Jeff Hardy does everything, he has the innate ability to make you think either he's fucked up. <laughs> Not that he's fucked up, but that he fucked up a move. Injured. Or just something's Injured wrong. Injured or in pain or in, you know, in agony. You can never tell what's intentional, what isn't with him. But uh, no, beyond that, the, to me, the story was the crowd. The Bucks, like we've been saying, they don't get anywhere near the reactions from anyone that they used to. The bloom is off the rose. Well, the, the bloom certainly fucking drooped at the end of this thing because you could hear the silence when people were watching because... They leave the buckaroos that hang nail in the ring, and then suddenly up on the big screen pops up Swerve Strickland, and Prince Nana is with him. And they are at hang of uh, what we are led to believe and told is Paige's front door of his house. And they somehow get in or break in. I don't know. Did Prince Nana do the credit card thing? We've seen it on cop shows. Apparently, Paige is a big-time professional sports star, but he can't hire a locksmith, and he's just got little fucking shitty locks. But they break into Hangnail Paige's house, and they are doing a live remote. Again, the, yes, you can now stream video from your phone, right? You can live stream what you're doing on Facebook or on the internet or whatever. But they still haven't worked out how you can break in at random on a goddamn national television program from your phone. Have they? Well, you could stream it to the truck, and then the truck puts it on the big screen. And then they cooperate. That's right. And show members of their roster committing felonious burglary and breaking and entering on live television. Well, to be fair, if they got this feed, if they got the stream from Swerve or Nana... Why would they expect that Swerve would ever do anything where he would go to someone's house and do anything illegal? Well, that's true, because there's not like there's a precedent. But as soon as Hangnail Page is the cowboy from rural Virginia, right? I don't know so what part of Virginia he's from, but he's from Virginia, I've heard. Well, but they're in Philadelphia here. Now, a lot of the guys live in Florida. And Paige is announced from Virginia, but nobody's ever said he lives in Philadelphia. But when he's standing in the ring and sees on the screen these two guys breaking in his house, he jumps out of the ring and runs to the back. Where does he live? In the fucking parking lot? Is his house next door to the... How's he going to get there? He must be running to the train station. What do you think? I forgot about those high-speed rails they got up there these days. How far is rural Virginia from Philadelphia? 30, 40 years. <laughs> that's, um, not, that's not what I meant. I meant oh, in terms of, if you were going to drive. Mileage wave, if you were going to drive, he could be there in six, seven hours. So at what uh, point does Swerve get arrested on the show? In, well, char in character, and again... It's hit and miss, the stuff with Swerve. The promos are typically all right, although he tries to be a cool heel, it seems like. The matches are good. The fans are into him. Again, a cool heel, it seems like. But then there's these, like, I'm going to just go assault someone or go to their house and film it, and nothing will happen. He gets arrested on AEW television the week after Tony Khan watches the episode of Memphis TV where Billy Joe Travis actually got arrested for non-payment of child support. 
but they talked the cops into waiting until after he went out and did his segment, and then they showed it on the air. Anyway, Nana was there, and he was jumping around in the kitchen eating berries, but Swerve was being serious, and he was like, yeah, pay, pay Joe's him. He cost him an opportunity, and he wants Paige to pay him what he owes him, and then suddenly, Swerve hears something, and they're walking down the hall, and now, I don't know... I think maybe Nana had the phone at first, but then Swerve got the phone and you see the video shaking and you hear the clump clump as they're walking down the hallway. And then they walk into the kid's nursery. And now Nana is like getting a limber tail. He's getting squeamish. He's like, oh, man, I don't like this idea, man. And Swerve sets the camera phone down so he's... I swear to God, the shot is him kneeling over the crib, but you can't see the inside the crib. The baby that he heard and went down the hall and found the fucking crib is allegedly in the crib, but you never see the baby. You also never hear the baby. The ba and he cuts a promo over the baby. Should you pay your daddy's debt? Maybe one day, but not today. And after he cuts this long, threatening promo, he throws the kid a swerve t-shirt and he throws it into the crib where it would have landed on the baby's fucking head. You've had children. I have not. You know more than I do. How big are these fucking cribs? About three by three? They're pretty small. You definitely don't want to throw anything over the baby's face. Could he have missed the baby if the baby was indeed in the crib with the t-shirt? Well, depending on the age of the baby, you wouldn't want to leave anything like that in the crib even if it misses the baby because they roll around, they move around, they could pull something over their face. Oh, there you go. Then he threw in a couple of plastic bags from Walmart into the crib. No, he throws the shirt into the crib. The baby never makes a sound. And again, we are alleged... Uh, asked to believe that allegedly... These two club-footed amateur cat burglars broke into this guy's house, were eating berries in the kitchen, sitting on the furniture, talking, and then walked down the hall, opening doors, cutting promo on the baby, bringing in merchandise for the baby. Who else is in the fucking house? And then someone comes in the front door, right? No, they don't. Don't they hear? Isn't that why they leave? They hear someone else come in? I don't, I didn't, I was still shaking my head. I don't know. Well, if that's the case, then Hangnail's wife only went down the hill to the fucking convenience store and left the baby alone in the middle of the night for these two fucking surreptitious burglars to come in. What? Here's a bigger question for you. The pay-per-view, he beat Hangman Page, right? In Seattle? Yes. What's he mad at Hangman Page about? Because Page cost him an opportunity at something. I think they're using title opportunity like title shot again. Maybe was it the multi-man thing? Was it the opportunity? Was it the match that he lost to Danielson? Did he lose an opportunity there for you the go. TNT yeah, yeah, title? Yeah. Well, whatever the fuck it was. <laughs> the point is the baby's invisible and the baby's a mute and the, the mother is obviously unfit and should be reported to Child Protective Services and these two guys committed breaking and entering and heinous threatening of an infant on live national cable television. And they went straight to the break so the announcers wouldn't have to react to it because how could they? Exactly. No chance for anyone to say anything about that. If it's an infant too, or even just a small child, you may have a baby monitor in there so that if they're not sleeping in your room, you can hear what's going on if they're struggling to breathe or if they're coughing or crying, whatever it may be. Or, well, if they're struggling to breathe, coughing and crying, just go in the room and turn AEW television off. Or don't throw your shirt on top of their face. <laughs> or, or mamas, don't let your babies grow up to be hangnail. I hate your dad. Here's some merch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and no, by the way, before anybody says, I'm not saying they should have had a baby. I'm not saying they should have had the baby, the little baby. I'm saying, what the fuck is this at all? Why would you do any of this? See, that's the thing. How does this get greenlit? 
who pitches this like okay the next move in the swerve saga he's gonna break into hangman page's house during dynamite and cut a promo on his baby cut a promo on his baby with prince nana as the watch out but they can't even add in the background or goo goo gaga I'm sure a lot of people are saying goo goo gaga when they're watching this show. We can't pipe that in. Like I said earlier, AEW is getting worse and worse. These segments in terms of now we have just crimes being sent in and played over the show. We have the lights going on and off. What was it? Seven times on collision <laughs> last week. I seriously, wasn't it like seven times? Yes. Yes. The lights went on and off. Well, and now is it, do you take on and off as separate or on and off? That's one. Then it was it was four or eight, one or the other. The show's getting worse and worse. The segment, every segment, whether it's a comedy segment with Adam Cole or a serious segment, like the attempted wasn't a kidnapping. I don't know what, just the promo on the baby in the, <laughs> the house. The, the attempted forced merchandising yeah. of the of the baby. He was he was given merchandise that he would not want forcefully. Who breaks into a house and leaves something? I groaned as soon as they showed him walking into the door of that house, him and Nana. I'm like, oh, no, they're not doing this. Because even though people talk about it today, like, I didn't like the Steve Austin, Brian Pillman thing at the house. No. Let alone the gun. I just didn't like the whole idea of it. And I didn't like this one here. Well, and some people will go back, well, well, that Dusty did it and the Horseman did it. And yes, they did videotape themselves doing a felonious assault but the way that it was explained in context was that they had hired a cameraman to shut up and shoot the message that they were going to send to all of dusty Rhodes's friends and they caught dusty in the parking lot and they broke his leg and they knew that dusty Rhodes was a man that wasn't going to call the police that he was going to try to handle things on his own and that was just fine with them if they if he wanted to come back it was all tied together and you could go with it it wasn't and they gave the film or the tape to Jim Crockett Promotions and it was aired with a caution that this was not something that obviously that we are condoning. This is what happened to Dusty Rhodes. And so now they're taking that and they're, we'll, we'll just put live felonies on the screen for everybody as they happen for our heel wrestlers because they asked us to. And it... <clears throat> Baby sound effect, also. Baby sound effect. Anyway. Terrible. Renee Moxley Good was with Edge, and he had just explained that he still was not going to fight his friend Christian, and Darby came in and said, don't be stupid. You, you know that, don't be stupid. Right, that's, a, that's some evergreen advice around there. And then Sting comes in and says, I can't even believe we're having this conversation. And that's where he said, I had blinders on with Luger. And I'm like, is there heat? Or are they referring to an angle that they did 25 years ago that nobody would really remember right now? I don't know what the fuck. But Sting, start, he did everything but slap Edge in the face. He's shaking him and patting him on his shoulders. Open your eyes. And then he says, we go way back. Don't mess it all up now. Get with it. I'm like, you go way back where? <laughs> where have you ever interacted with these with this person? Sting has never been in the WWE until Christian left, right? Right. And when uh well, not Christian, you're talking about Edge, Adam Copeland. Or I'm, I'm sorry, Edge, rather. It, Sting was never in the WWE until Edge left, and then Sting was there briefly while Edge was gone, that Edge came back after Sting had left. Sting has spent time with Christian in TNA. Is he confused as to which part of the team that he goes way back with? Because he has much more history with Christian than he does with Edge. What the fuck are they talking about here? Where would Sting and Edge have ever interacted before in public to go way back or anything that we've ever heard of in private that has ever even been intimated as to where they go way back? No, when Edge came in, one of the things he said was, you know, he's never been in the ring with so many different people. He named Sting. Yes. I've never been in the ring with Sting before. 
but apparently they go way back. They go way back, but now he's going to mess it all up if Edge doesn't get with it. So apparently Edge is going to be the third partner. And they're right. What the fuck's Edge's problem? Again, I'm here to help my <laughs> former friend who's a complete dick. Yes. He's setting babies on fire in the streets and stealing old women's S&H green stamps. So naturally, I will not fight him. I'll just wait until he, the other criminals he's with stab him in the back and then I'll help him because then he'll be sorry he committed all these crimes. This is the logic? Help me. Well, seemingly it is uh, the logic. I can't really explain it. Obviously, we think we know where they're going. It seems pretty apparent. This may be one of those times where the right thing is to do what's obvious and not fuck this up any further. And we'll see where they go. Edge right. and Chris, uh, Edge and Darby and Sting versus Christian and Nick Wayne and Luchasaurus. Boy, that'll be interesting. And... Uh, We'll see if Ric Flair is involved, but if Ric Flair is going to be involved or not, it may be the kind of thing you want to make a wager on. Well, you know, that's the thing, Brian, because the last time Las Vegas was buzzing with the uh, the wagering on Flair's last match, what, what time are they going to call time of death? When is the heart attack going to happen? When is... They, they are, is Rick going to be dead in the ring for five to ten minutes before they stop the match? All kinds of wagering could have gone on. They certainly could have. It's certainly, it uh, certainly it, it, they, there's it, they. certainties to this equation. <laughs> but folks, I'll tell you what, if you've been waiting for the NBA to come back, the National Basketball Alliance... Well, they're back. Association. And, and they're associated with DraftKings Sportsbook. So if you want to bet on National Basketball Alliance games, all you got to do is go to and associate with DraftKings Sportsbooks. I'll have you know that right now, DraftKings, an official sports betting partner of the National Basketball Alliance, is celebrating... An unbeatable no, offer. It's the association. They're the partners with the NBA, the National Basketball Association. There is no alliance. Oh, are, the, are they in competition? Are they like outlaws competing with the National Basketball Alliance? There's two leagues in competition for supremacy? Well, no, there's one NBA. Uh, that is a registered Well, trademark. that's right. The only NBA that you're wanting to talk about is the one that's partners with DraftKings Sportsbook, the National Basketball Alliance. And right now... New customers can score $200 instantly in bonus bets. All you got to do is bet $5 on the NBA. Win or lose, it doesn't matter. Well, it matters to you. You might be pissed if you lose. As a matter of fact, if you lose, it might ruin your day. But they don't care because they're still going to give you the $200 in bonus bets. And you're going to start the season off the right way. And with DraftKings parlays, everybody's got a shot at even bigger basketball wins. Brian, are you, are you a basketball connoisseur like you know the baseball? Not like I know the baseball, but I've always loved the Knicks, just like my dad did. And they've been uh, bad for a number of years, but it seems to be uh, a situation getting better. But ownership sucks. But there's always something to look forward to. I don't think we needed to. all that detail. But nevertheless, uh, you know, like DraftKings says, basketball's more fun when you're in on the action. When you can call them up and, and all you got to do is download the DraftKings Sportsbook app right now and use the code JCE and they'll let you right into the thing. And then you can bet on whether Metal Arc Lemon is going to score a three-pointer in the finals of game nine of the NBA series. Well, no. Or you could... You could bet whether Curly Neal is going to travel or whether he's going to be able to successfully execute that dribble all the I'm way not, down the court and between Guy Sosby's legs. I don't know if any of these classic Globetrotters are still alive, so I don't think you could bet on any of these things that you're putting out there, but there are real basketball players playing in the real NBA, the National Basketball Association, uh -huh. and you can keep up with what they're doing, and if you know your stuff, make a few bucks while doing indeed that. Well, if you want to bet on the outlaws, that's up to you. But right now, folks, download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and use the code JCE. And that's how you're going to get 
the $200 in bonus bets instantly for betting just $5 only on DraftKings Sportsbook with the code JCE. Download the app and the crown is yours. So you're going to get crowned as soon as you deal with the people at DraftKings Sportsbook. Well, not in the uh, classic um, slugged sense, but you will get crowned well, with... What, what, wait a minute. What kind of classic slug sense are you talking about? You're going to be crowned a king. King me. That's when you get crowned. They're going to put a big checker on top of your head, make you twice as tall as you are now. The crown will be yours. Move over, Lawler. That's right. Jerry the King Lawler, now the, the you're going to be the king of your own gambling domain with DraftKings Sportsbook. These people, they, they, if, these people, they've got all the experience. They started the gambling in the Old West, you know, in Boot Hill. What? It, they come from Boot Hill Casino. That's where they started gambling, and that's why they had the graveyard out back, because if you didn't pay up when you lost, boom, you're in Boot Hill. Well, no, I don't know if any of this is uh, has anything to do with DraftKings, this story. Well, this... it certainly does. It's in the fine here. I'll get to it here shortly when I start reading all this fucking effluvia. But anyway, folks, if you don't want to end up in Boot Hill, then you better download the DraftKings Sportsbook app right now and use the code JCE because they'll give you $200 in bonus bets. But if you don't, then you may end up pushing up daisies there, Padna, out there in nope. Boot Hill. That's not the way it works. Tumbleweeds blowing across your corpse. Again, this is not the way it works, but if you love your sports... Well, if, if you run into a guy with two six-guns that's faster than your draw, Pilgrim, then I'll tell you what's going to happen with the aces and eights down there in the Old West. All right, this is the not, this is the not okay corral right now, but let's get back to DraftKings. Of course, none of this will be taking place, but if you know your stuff, you got a chance to win some stuff. What's yeah. the promo code one more time, Jim? One, and one more time. Down, 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 King, the draft board. <laughs> no. Something like that. Download. <laughs> oh, I've strained myself. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app. Use the code JCE. Get the extra 200 bucks when you bet just $5. The crown is yours. And if you've got a gambling problem or a problem reading all this copy, Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit www.1800gambler.net in New York. Call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY, parenthetically, 467-369. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org. I thought that was the, the uh, code word for Russia. No, that was CC. What was it? Nevertheless, C -C -C please play responsibly. CCCP. Please play responsibly. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort in Kansas. See, you'll end up there one day. Licensee partner Golden Nugget Lake Charles, Louisiana. Period. That sounds like just anecdotally. There's part of a sentence there. 21 plus age varies by jurisdiction. Void in Ontario. Bonus bets expire 168 hours after in issuance. 168 hours? Look that up and see if that's even days. See sportsbook.draftkings.com slash basketball. Terms for eligibility and deposit restrictions, terms, and responsible gaming resources. Words, phrases, and numbers. The end. The end with DraftKings. No, it's only the beginning of DraftKings. It's the end of the copy. Well, I don't know how much money I would make if you had asked me right now if that was... How much more, I guess, of dynamite was left? How much more of dynamite was left? Well, not much, but just enough. And by the way, we go way back, so don't mess this all up now. So then what? Ruby Soso wrestled Hikaru Shida. Your thoughts? It was... I, I watched it in the background on mute. I had other things going on. I'm glad I saw what I saw. I wish I would have seen the rest. It was incredibly sloppy for something that's on a main level show. And as people that cry that the AEW women's division don't get a fair shot, every shot they get on this show, they don't look good. Statlander looks all right. Willow Nightingale's all right. Jamie Hayter, when she was able to 
Wrestle was good. Walk. But man, this division is just not good. This match was really not good. Well, now you're making me sorry I didn't watch it. No, you got, if you have it on the DVR, go back and watch. It was just sloppy. And on top of that, a dead crowd. Whatever energy the crowd had left, Ric Flair took. <laughs> because the Bucks match had no crowd heat. He probably invited half of them back to the bar. Yeah, so this was uh, really not good. All righty, then Renee Moxley Good was with MJF in the trainer's room, and he's getting his arm worked on, but she's got to interrupt him, so the trainer just walks off like, okay, this is obviously more important. And before he can talk, Samoa Joe comes in and tells MJF, hey, you know, basically he's got all these people after him. I'll watch your back. And MJF, well, that sounds good, and they shake. Him, Jeff, just like that, accepts that, and then says, Joe said, or Joe says, on one condition, give me my rematch for the AEW title. So now we're being led down the path. Is MJF going to make a deal with Joe to watch his back because of all these other goofy people that want to be his friends? Then, then Joe will want to fight him afterwards, and blah, blah, blah. And then finally, we came to the main event. I like that, by the way. I, I like That was the one thing I did like. I like using Samoa Joe kind of like that. He still wants his title shot. Remember, MJF beat him, and they showed each other respect at the end of that. Yeah, I like the idea of Joe and MJF having another match because that was the best one that, you know, either one's had in a while. And, but again, MJF is involved in everything, but there's so many subpar players and goofy holes in logic in, and comedy sprinkled into this thing that I'm afraid the whole thing is dragging everybody down. That's just me. What about you? Again, I like the MJF Samoa Joe thing, but MJF's now involved. We, I mean, we said it last time, and then it ended up happening more on this show. He's involved in multiple different things with multiple different people. Wardlow, Omega, Adam Cole slash Roddy Strong, Samoa Joe, Bullet Club Gold. I mean, he's the world champion. Everyone Haven should be. Haven and are in there. Yeah, I mean, he's the world champion. Everyone should be going after him, but. Yeah, but most of these people aren't main event people. They don't have a lot of main event people. That's the other problem. Ooh. Well, speaking of the main event, let's get to it. Because I've got very little to say. Danielson and Claudio faced Pockets and Okada. They bring Okada to the United States. He's supposed to be a big goddamn deal in New Japan Pro Wrestling. They want, apparently, the United States audience to like him and to think he's as big a deal as the New Japan audience does. So they bring him over here and they put him on TV and they partner him up with the mascot. How are anybody in the United States that are, that are not familiar with Okada or that he's a big star there supposed to take him seriously if this is how he's portrayed to the people that don't know who the fuck he is? And that's that. That's my comment on this fucking match. Because I wasn't going to watch anything involving pockets because my time is valuable and if they don't take it seriously i'm not going to either and then you said well what did they do for the finish because people have been telling me what about that fucking finish and so i go back and zip through the whole show on dvr again to look at the finish and they can't manage their time <laughs> and my dvr froze the match was still going on i don't know what the finish was so can you tell me what they did for the finish? The finish was Claudio got the win, but Orange Cassidy punched Danielson in the jaw, and then Danielson went down selling his jaw, and everyone was concerned, Moxley and the doctor. And then... Wait a minute, so wait a minute, so Brian Danielson... Many people say the best in-ring wrestler in the world, one of their main event guys, 
got knocked out to the point where the doctor had to be called into the ring by one punch by this fucking emaciated Valvoline mechanic? Well, not knocked out, just knocked down and obviously teasing some jaw damage. At that point, the other party came in, the uh, best friends and Statlander and Hulk. Oh, boy. To watch Orange Cassidy and Okada. Oh, and Rocky Romero. Oops. To watch Orange Cassidy and Okada's back. And then you get this weird... You know, square square off. I keep calling it that. This weird face-off between the uh, Blackpool babyface heels and Orange Cassidy and his folks. And... But did Claudio cheat to... I don't... I, hold on, I'm going to play if this. If Claudio didn't cheat to win, then why did the other babyface knock his partner out? You're not... I don't... Well, let me try... I got it on my DVR. You, I, I have it here. Okay. I have it here on YouTube, actually, because uh, it's not on uh, the episode. So AEW put up the last few minutes for everyone whose DVR didn't. Oh, cause, it. yeah, because nobody that DVR the show was going to see the finish either, like every fucking week. So they have to put it on YouTube, even though they've got a television show because they can't manage their time. All so right. can you explain to me by watching it what the fuck happened? I'm a little a little past eight minutes into their video. Okada is in the middle of the ring. He is lifting his arms in his Rainmaker pose. Orange Cassidy is taking advantage of that by giving him a hug. The camera (laughs) zooms out again. Danielson with a dropkick kicking both competitors in his new green and blue trunks. I thought it was a one-time thing in Seattle. It's every time thing now. Him and Okada going back and forth. Okada's a foot taller than him. Yet the dropkick was unimpressive. He did not really take Danielson's head off with that dropkick. And while Okada has Danielson from behind, Orange Cassidy gave him the punch. Okada turned that into his Rainmaker clothesline. And now he goes for it on Claudio. Claudio instead off the second rope with a European uppercut, which always looks like shit. And now he gives one to Orange Cassidy, who he throws high in the air. Claudio, clean pin Orange Cassidy. And now... Danielson on the apron, selling his jaw. No one knows what's going on. Philadelphia has not been this quiet since... I don't know when, actually. Every one of their shows had pretty lively crowds. <laughs> but Danielson being looked at by Doc Philadelphia Samson. Philadelphia hadn't been this quiet since the bell cracked. And now Claudio is concerned. Claudio coming over to check on his fallen Blackpool Combat Club compadre. The Doc is talking into his headset. Claudio is waving someone. He's asking for some kind of help. Here comes Wheeler Yuta, not a paramedic. And Moxley, who doesn't seem all that concerned, <laughs> actually. What the? F- they are pouring water over Danielson's jaw. Oh, my God. Because that would, uh, I would think, help. And now outcome, who's hitting the ring now? It is, yes, the best friends and Rocky Romero and Hook and Chris Statlander. And Okada is I thought he was checking on Danielson. He's actually taunting him a little bit while Moxley and Claudio stand there and stare at him. Hook is down on one knee. He's either having a religious moment or he just doesn't know what to do because there's not much to do. Just a lot of people standing there staring at each other. It was a clean victory, by the way. There was no cheating involved the in fu- any and way. Claudia, Claudio, oh, next week, they, they just announced next week, Claudio Castagnoli versus Orange Cassidy. Oh, good Lord. So they beat Okada, right? No, they beat Orange Cassidy. Oh, they beat, okay, at least they beat Pockets. So to give him some level of heat back, as they say, the kids these days, they have him knock out Danielson to the point where he needs medical attention with that fake phony looking fucking buggy whip arm punch. Listen, the end of this show is everyone standing around like they don't know what to do. Like they're waiting for someone to say, it's over, go back now. Like every, like Okada, it was like he was taunting him too much to the point where why is Moxley just standing there and taking? Why isn't Moxley doing anything? Because actually, what's he going to do if Okada didn't want him to do something? Probably nothing, actually. Probably fucking nothing, and like it, with a smile on his face. Fucking bald, sunken, chested fucking plumber. All right, well, there we go. Uh, That was AEW Dynamite. We don't have the ratings just yet, but we may either shortly or after some... 
Yeah, we may have Control. to time travel just to see what happened there. It'll look like the fucking Dow Jones average on in October 1929.